Greetings again, my brothers and sisters. Welcome back to Disciple Talk, <clears throat> the teaching ministry of the First Congregation of Church. Well, we are in John's Gospel, chapter 3 now. And again, just to remind everyone, we're learning about the glory of Christ in the Gospel of John. I also want to add today as we go to chapter 3, that I am also supplementing the teaching of chapter 3, God, John chapter 3, with my messages on Sunday through the sermons in which we are also highlighting what's going on in John chapter 3. So I want to encourage you to listen to the sermons from Sunday as well as the Disciple Talk Bible studies over the next several weeks as we'll be dealing with the third chapter of the Gospel of John. And I believe this gospel is the gospel that reveals the glory of Christ. And when we come to this third chapter, some of the most famous verses in the Bible are there. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our minds to see the glory of Christ as we have been in John chapter 3, as well as understand the most important priority of the church, which is salvation. And that's what we want to deal with today. So let us pray. Father, open our eyes that we might see the wonderful things in your word. I'd like to begin today by uh, uh, reading the scriptures. Today we'll deal with John chapter 3, verses 1 through 15. It says there, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs or miracles that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wills, wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Holy Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Verse 11, truly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And no one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, eternal life. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. And as we now begin to dissect these verses, I want you to know that one of the primary things that the third chapter of John is revealing to us is that the, one of the priorities, the utmost priority of King Jesus and his kingdom as we represent him and the kingdom of God through the church in the world today is the salvation of souls. Now, don't, don't take that lightly. Salvation is the very core mission of why Christ came. He came to give his life a ransom for many. He came to accomplish the work of atonement through his death and resurrection from the dead. Thus, 
the third chapter of John should remind us, the third chapter of John should remind us that the priority of King Jesus and the kingdom of God in the world today is that people will hear the witness of the gospel and be saved. So I want to share something with you as we get into these first few verses in background. Nicodemus has come to Jesus Christ. And as we've studied in chapter two, he has heard about the miracles of Jesus. As you look at um, uh, chapter two, verse 23. Now, when he, Jesus, when he was in Jerusalem, when Jesus was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, John 2, 23 says, many believed in him when they saw the signs or miracles which he did. And Nicodemus not only remembered the cleansing of the temple, obviously, but he also had heard of other miracles that Jesus was doing and maybe had witnessed some. We don't know, but we know from the 23rd verse of the second chapter that Jesus had done other miracles besides just turning the water into wine. And Nicodemus has come to Jesus now in verse one out of what I believe a sincerity to understand who this person is and to get more information. Though he's still not saved, he's not a believer. He is a ruler of the Jews. He is the one of the 70 of the Sanhedrin council, meaning within the Sanhedrin group, which numbered about 6,000, there was a council that made up was made up of 70 men. Nicodemus was one of those 70. And that's why it says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He was one of the Sanhedrin council members, one of the highest ranking within the Pharisaic order. Now, it begs us to go a little further before we actually get into the text to understand that when we're dealing with salvation, we must understand what true salvation is. This is why I believe John recorded the incident of Jesus and Nicodemus coming together. Because here you have a highly religious person, a highly moral person, a person who is in his mind believes he's serving the true and the living God. Now, this is important to understand as we get into these verses. Nicodemus was a moral man. Nicodemus was a religious man. Not only that, he was a leader in the nation of Israel in regard to the Pharisaical order. This is who came to Jesus by night. He came to Jesus by night because he wanted to, oh, to, to seek something or sincerely seek something in what he had seen and heart had been stirred through the miraculous power of Jesus at the beginning of his miracle. Now, I want to lay something down before we go further again. Religion cannot save you. Religion cannot save you. Keep that in mind. What do we mean by religion? Religious activity, religious uh, uh, observances, religious things that are done under the guise of Christian living, religious activity. And this is important because what we see in Nicodemus was that he was a moral person. And some people think that because I live a moral life, a good moral life, I, I'm not a whoremonger, I'm not a liar, I'm not a thief, I'm not a person who cheats, and they trust in their moral uprightness in society as a sign of that they know the Lord in the church. This is not the way to salvation. Moralism is what it's called, and it cannot save you, just like religious activity cannot save you. But what we discover in Nicodemus is that he had an issue of activity, he had an issue of moralism, but his biggest problem that undergirded all these other things was that he was a stone legalist. He believed that he could be saved by observing 
the law, by obeying the law. And the Pharisees were some of the strictest legalists you would ever run into. They sought to obey the law to the letter. As Paul said, if you, go, if you look at what I do by the law, I'm blameless. We'll look at that a little later. But Nicodemus represents the ultimate classic example of a legalist, a person who seeks to know God through legalism. So, you know, this is important to understand. Legalism is trying to achieve salvation through obedience to the law. Now, I want you to go back to the sermon I did on Sunday where I really broke down the issue of the purpose of the law and these issues which undergirded what Nicodemus was all about. See, in verse 2, he comes and says to Jesus, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him in the greeting, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher. Come from God, for no one can do the signs which he did. Now, this platitude of greeting, this greeting platitude that he gave to Jesus is something that we got to understand as well. Jesus uh, uh, was a teacher. But what Nicodemus failed to understand when he said, you're a teacher come from God, is that he did not know that Jesus was God. He did not recognize Jesus as God the Son. He did not recognize Jesus as being divine. He just recognized Jesus as a teacher from God who had miraculous power. And that is something that is important to note right here. Because Nicodemus was a legalist, it blinded him to see the glory of Christ. The miracles of Christ were to point to his divinity, to his deity, to his eternality. And thus, he acknowledges the miracles Nicodemus does, but he doesn't acknowledge them that this man is God. But he says, you are a teacher come from God. And Jesus, in verse 3, immediately deals with him. Now, immediately Jesus deals with him. But before I get to verse 3, I want to go back to say something about Nicodemus. Please understand this. I believe Nicodemus had a sincere desire to know, who to know what Christ was about. He came by night. He risked things as a Pharisee to come to meet with Jesus. Because when Jesus came on the scene, he was hated by the Pharisees. And many people wanted to kill him. But we understand, despite Nicodemus' legalism, obviously the Holy Spirit was dealing with him at this time, though he wasn't saved. Because we can see in John chapter 7, another incident with Jesus. It says here in John 7, 50, John chapter 7 and verse 50, where... Uh, they had asked some soldiers to go get Jesus. And in John 7, 46, 45, then the officers came to the chief priests and Pharisees who said, why have you not brought him? And the officers answered and said, no man ever spoke like this man. Verse 47, then the Pharisees answered them, are you also deceived? Have any of the rulers, meaning People like Nicodemus of, or the Pharisees believed in him. Verse 49, but this crowd does not know the law. They don't know the law is a curse. This is what the Pharisees were saying. But look at verse 50. Verse 50, Nicodemus, who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, said to them, does our law judge a man before it hears him? And knows what he is doing. And they answered and said to Nicodemus, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has arisen from Galilee. But what we see in these verses is Nicodemus, after he has had this encounter with Jesus in chapter 3, he then, he then stands up for Jesus in John chapter 7 and advocates against their uh, blind uh, 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 actions to try to destroy Jesus and, and Nicodemus in verse 50 one says does our law judge a man before before 
he is heard. And we also know that Nicodemus came to faith in Christ when we look at John 19 and verse 38. John 19 and verse 38, when Jesus had been uh, crucified and they came to get the body, it says in John 19, 38, and Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took the body of Jesus. Now look at verse 39. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred pounds. And they, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen and with the spices as the custom was to bury. So we know that Nicodemus became a true believer. But when he meets with Christ in the third chapter, verse one and two and following, he is a strict legalist. He's trying to get somewhere and his legalism has blinded him. So when we see the first two verses of John chapter three, we see a lost religious leader coming to the one who can save him and beginning a conversation that would lead to his salvation. Because in verse three, after Jesus responds to Nicodemus uh, in his greeting, in John 3, 3, Jesus answered and said to him, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, my brothers and sisters, this is important because here's a man who said he knew God. Here's a man who was moral. Here's a man who was religious, but here's a man that had the wrong understanding of how you come to saving faith. He didn't have saving faith. He was trusted in his own legalistic efforts to save him. That's why Jesus immediately in verse three goes straight to what he needs. He says, Nicodemus, you can't even see the kingdom. You can't even see it unless you're born again. And this is the key to understanding that the main role of the church, the main role of the kingdom is exemplified by the king himself by trying to bring a religious lost person to salvation. That's what it's all about. And my brother says this is important because as I said Sunday, there are a lot of people who attend church. There's a lot of people who are religious. There are a lot of people who are good moral people living good moral lives. And they are trusting in themselves for their salvation. And this is important because Nicodemus is a classic example of a religious lost person. See, a religious lost person. So when Jesus, who knows he's a legalist, who knows he's still lost in his sins, knows he's not spiritually alive at all, he immediately tells him what must happen. You must be born again, Nicodemus. You must have a new birth. You must be born from above. You must be born of the Holy Spirit. Now, this rock Nicodemus, because in verse four, he said to him, said to Jesus, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb? Obviously a ignorant statement, but in his confusion of what Christ was trying to tell him, he just responded with a carnal response that obviously uh, was of the flesh and had and further proved his total ignorance of the spiritual birth. Look at what verse J Jesus says in verse five. Truly I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now, Jesus is emphasizing the true way to salvation. The way to salvation is not through religious activity, through moralism or through legalism. It's by a new birth that is accomplished by the water and the Holy Spirit. Now, there's been many interpretations by commentators about the water, 
But I believe that when he refers to the water, born of water, he's talking about the word. There's many times in the gospel where Jesus told the apostles, you are clean through the word I have spoken unto you. Thus, the washing is the word. And thus, when we look at this text, it's the word of God and the Holy Spirit that brings people into the new birth. Into the new birth or the being born again, born from above to enter the kingdom of God. For he says in verse six, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit, the Holy Spirit is spirit or spiritual. Now, this issue of the new birth in academic terms is called regeneration. Regeneration. And this is a an act of God through the Holy Spirit based on the gospel, the word of God that you must hear and to be saved, to become a Christian, to become a part of the kingdom of God. This is shown doctrinally in Titus chapter three, Titus chapter three. And I like to begin at verse three. It says there, for we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Verse four, but when the kindness of the love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Now here's the key. Verse five, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. Now go further. Look at verse five through the washing. See, there's the water, the washing of regeneration. The word of God comes through the gospel and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit uses the word, cleanses us through the word, and then gives us regeneration through the power of God, the Holy Spirit. He regenerates our spirit. What's born of the Holy Spirit is spirit, Jesus says. And then it says, Verse six, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And that's the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit actually places us or immerses us into the body of Christ at salvation. This is what I teach as the baptism of the Spirit. The baptism that is symbolically seen by being immersed in water, which cleanses us and raising up, showing the resurrection. Thus, the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, third person of the Trinity, is instrumental in the new birth. But the Holy Spirit brings about this regeneration, this washing and the ongoing renewal when a person believes the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, this is also uh, verified in Ephesians chapter one. This is important. Ephesians chapter one, verse 13, as we talk about the new birth. Listen. Ephesians 1.13, in him you also trusted, now get this, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom having believed you were sealed or stamped or approved with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the purchase, the possession of of the purchased possession, the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. So when Jesus talks about being born again, born from above, he's talking about the, the sovereign act of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to uh, miraculously change a person from a, a sinner to a saint to spiritually bring new life, spiritual life, into a person who was spiritually dead. This is accomplished by the Holy Spirit. And in verse 7, Jesus said, Therefore, don't marvel that I said you must be born again. He says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you can't tell where it comes from or where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Holy Spirit. This is the key. The Holy Spirit here is given the illusion 
of being like wind. You can't see the wind. You don't know where it comes from or where it goes, but you can feel the effects of the wind. And thus the new birth is the movement of the Holy Spirit in the life of a person who has turned to Christ through the gospel, believed on Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit does the supernatural regenerating of that person. Just like it happens in everybody's life. It says very plainly in Romans 5 that the Holy Spirit has been poured out. The love of God has been poured out on us in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And thus Nicodemus reminds us of a religious, moral, legalistic person who was not saved. Jesus immediately begins to tell him the only way to be saved is you must be born again. Now, next week, we'll get into some other very important aspects of this being born again in regard to what you must believe. See, in the Bible, I don't say anything about accept the Lord. I don't know why we keep using these words to accept the Lord. To accept the Lord means you, you make a choice or something is something you do. Listen. The only thing the Bible tells us to do is believe the Lord. Believing is a stronger word in the Greek than accepting. Accepting is like, I, I got a choice. Listen, you have a choice in nothing when it comes to salvation. I had a choice in nothing when it came to salvation. What I had was a call to believe. That's what he says. And when we believe, the Holy Spirit moves, is illustrated like the wind. You don't know how he does it, why he does it, where he does it, but there's a change in my heart. Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? He didn't have a clue how they could be. He was spiritually dead, spiritually ignorant, and didn't have faith. Jesus answered and said to him, are you a teacher meaning you're a ruler of the Sanhedrin council and you don't understand these things. He should have known this from Ezekiel 36. He was an expert in the Old Testament, but that's another thing. Legalism points you to the letter. Without faith, you can't access the spirit of the letter. And he says, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify. Jesus is telling Nicodemus in verses 11 and 12, you don't even receive our testimony. You don't believe. You are an unbeliever. I can't tell you heavenly things because you can't even believe the earthly things I'm telling you. Thus, he sees the plight. And he uses the example of Jesus being lift, uh, of Moses, I mean the serpent being lifted up in the, in the wilderness by Moses when the people were being bitten. And he says, whoever believes on him should not perish but have everlasting life. So when the Son of Man is lifted up, just like the serpent, and people believe on him, they will have everlasting life. Well, I'm going to have to stop here, and we'll go further next week in the Disciple Talk Bible Study. Let us pray. Father, open our eyes to see the truths you're teaching us so that we'll know the true way to salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week on the next Disciple Talk Bible study. Love you.